With a few exceptions, such as the Shiningen Spears and the finds of wooden tools at Pogeti Vecchi, almost all of our knowledge about the Middle Paleolithic comes from durable materials such as bone and stone. We know from observations of our own surroundings that most of the material culture of humans is comprised of perishable materials. Previously, researchers have demonstrated that the micro-environment immediately surrounding a stone tool can preserve microscopic fragments of what is otherwise invisible. This is true for the preservation of a three-ply string fragment stuck to a stone tool from a Brie du Maras labelled G8128, which demonstrates that the cord is at least contemporary with the deposition and burial of the flake and is therefore of Middle Paleolithic origin. Examination of photomicrographs revealed three bundles of fibre with S-twists, which is when a yarn is spun counterclockwise which were then plied together with a Z-twist, which is when the yarn is spun clockwise, to form a three-ply cord. Doing this locks the fibres together and prevents it from unravelling, creating an exponentially stronger material. It's the same engineering we find today, with metal cables holding up suspension bridges or rope on sailing ships. The cord is approximately 6.2 millimetres in length and approximately 0.5 millimetres in width. Wood fibres have also been found at the site, some of which show signs of cordage manufacturing, but not sufficient enough to come to a final conclusion. So far, G8128 is the only concrete evidence we have of Neanderthal's use of fibre technology. The cord is not necessarily related to the use of tools. If it was buried at the same time as the flake, it could have been wrapped around it as part of a haft or could even have been part of a net or bag. Hafting is the process of attaching a tool to a handle or strap, like a stone arrowhead or axe head. Previous analysis of impact fractures on artefacts from the site suggests the use of hafting and provide support for this possibility. If it was deposited before the flake, it could represent a number of different items, but still illustrates the use of fibre technology at the site. In terms of actual preservation of fibre technology, the Upper Paleolithic waterlogged site of Ohalo 2 yielded three fragments of fibres with a Z-twist, approximately 19,000 years old. Remnants of a six-ply cord were found at Lasso and date to approximately 17,000 years old, both of which are attributed to Homo sapiens. The cord fragments from Abri du Maras is older still, dating to between 41 and 52,000 years ago. It appears increasingly likely that fibre technology is much older than previously thought. This discovery is exciting enough, as organic technologies are usually long rotted away. But impressive technology like this also gives us gratifying glimpses into Neanderthal minds. Making strong string is unlikely to have been invented just in that instance by one individual. It's more likely that the community knowledge of the technique was acquired and passed on through imitation or direct instruction from generation to generation. While it is clear that the cord from Abri du Maras demonstrates Neanderthal's ability to manufacture cordage, it hints at a much larger fibre technology. Once the production of a twisted, plied cord has been accomplished, it is possible to manufacture bags, mats, nets, fabric, baskets, structures, snares, and even watercraft. The cord from Abri du Maras likely consists of fibres derived from conifers. The fibrous layer of the inner bark is referred to as bast and eventually hardens to form bark. In order to make cordage, Neanderthals had extensive knowledge of the growth and seasonality of these trees. 
bast fibres are easier to separate from the bark and the underlying wood in early spring as the sap begins to rise. Ropes and baskets are central to a large number of human activities. They facilitate the transport and storage of food, aid in the design of tools for fishing, or perhaps used to make objects for recreational means such as dolls for children. The technological and artistic applications of twisted fibre technologies are vast. Once adopted, fibre technology would have been indispensable and would have been a big part of everyday life. Fibre acquisition, processing and production may have also played an important role in scheduling daily and seasonal activities. Although wooden artefacts are rare, other finds do attest to Neanderthals' detailed knowledge of trees. They chose boxwood for its density and used fire in the production of digging sticks at Pogete Vecchi approximately 175,000 years ago. In the construction of the Schinningen spears, they decentered the point to increase strength. Furthermore, Neanderthals were manufacturing birch bark tar and using it as an adhesive in the middle Pleistocene of Italy. Based on this evidence, the utilisation of bast fibres from trees is an obvious outcome of their intimate arboreal knowledge. The production of cordage requires an understanding of mathematical concepts and general numeracy in the creation of sets of elements and pairs of numbers to create a structure. Although this is the oldest direct evidence of cordage, there is older evidence that exists in the form of jewellery. In my last video, we discussed the findings of both eagle talons and seashells, which were both from separate sites. What was fascinating about these finds was that they displayed evidence of the use of string or some material to hold them together, like a necklace or bracelet. The eagle talons are the oldest of the two and date to 130,000 years ago, while the seashells date to 115,000 years ago. Humans have been making stone tools for well over 3.3 million years. Spanning half of this time, stone tools were unsophisticated and were fashioned only when needed. But about 1.5 million years ago, something began to change. Our ancestors started making stone tools that were more standardised, often in the form of teardrop-shaped axes. These tools were labelled Achillean tools and were both more durable, effective and versatile than the older older one tools. But the innovation of our human ancestors didn't stop there. After the rise of the Achillean industrial era, which spanned over a million years, a better, more sophisticated technique was introduced by Neanderthals, called the Lavelloa Technique. Named after the archaeological site outside of Paris where the technique was first recognised and described by archaeologists in the 1860s, the process allows a toolmaker to create a tool of predictable size and shape. For the Lavelloa Technique, the toolmaker takes an oblong, relatively flat, flint nodule and strikes flakes off the thinner side of the core all the way around its circumference. They then flip the nodule over and strike flakes off its front side, then flip it again to do the same on the back. Finally, after a lot of such preparation, the toolmaker strikes one end of the core to remove a large and distinctive Lavelloa flake. Properly prepared, such a core can yield several flakes of predictable size and shape all of which can be used as tools. Archaeologists have therefore pointed to its appearance as a watershed moment in human cognition. The degree of foresight and planning required to create a Lavelloa core is far greater than that required for all previous stone tool technologies, including hand axes. But why is this important? It's important because for the first time we can see our ancestors focused on an abstract concept, a flake of predictable size and shape that did not become clear until the final Lavelloa flake was removed from the core. 
The Lavalua technique is also associated with two other hominin populations, late Homo heidelbergensis and Homo sapiens. All three species of humans span throughout Asia, North Africa and Europe, and this is where we find the Lavalua technique. It's thought, however, that these populations developed this technique independently and was not a result of communication or imitation between species. In Armenia, archaeologists found a series of artefacts preserved in deep layers. The artefacts were dated at 325 to 335,000 years old and were a mix of two distinct stone tool technology traditions bifacial tools and lavalua tools. Anthropology professor and co-director of the excavations, Daniel Adler, suggests that the coexistence of bifacial and lavalua tools at the site provides the first clear evidence that local populations develop lavalua technology out of existing bifacial technology and that the artefacts found at the site reflect the technological flexibility and variability of a single population. Whether humans develop this technique independently or not, we will never truly know. But what we do know is that the replacement of bifacial stone tools such as hand axes by tools made from flakes detached from Lavelloa cores documents the most important conceptual shift in stone tool production strategies since the arrival of bifacial technology more than one million years earlier, and as the evidence suggests, it was started by Neanderthals. There is very little doubt that many ancient civilizations had good navigational and sailing skills, given the long history of the sea. Ancient civilizations built several maritime routes and traded goods like spices, gold, silk and many other commodities after realizing the benefits of trade. With suggestions that Homo erectus conquered the sea, it will come as no surprise to you when I say that Homo sapiens may have not been the first humans to set sail. Currently, the oldest boat to be found is the Pesse Canoe which was found in the Netherlands, dating to roughly 10,000 years old. We find little evidence of boats being used before this, because they would have been made from perishable materials like wood and rope. The stone and bone that is so common in the archaeological record wouldn't have been used in a boat's construction. Therefore, we can't necessarily rely on archaeological evidence to back this theory. We must look at other pieces of evidence like the migration of humans, and take into context what the land would have looked like at the time. Stone tools that are uniquely associated with Neanderthals have been found on islands in the Mediterranean Sea, suggesting that Neanderthals had figured out how to travel by boat. Neanderthals lived around the Mediterranean from 300,000 years ago. Their distinctive Mousterian stone tools are found on the Greek mainland and, unusually, have been also found on the Greek islands of Lefkada, Kefalonia and Zakynthos. The journeys to the Greek islands from the mainland were quite short, 5 to 12 kilometres. But according to Thomas Strasser of Providence College in Rhode Island, the Neanderthals didn't stop there. In 2008, he found similar stone tools on Crete, which he says are at least 130,000 years old. Crete has been an island for roughly 5 million years and is 40 kilometers from its closest neighbor, suggesting a far more ambitious journey. The big question is, how did they get there? That sort of distance wouldn't necessarily require boats to make the journey the Neanderthals might have just swam across. But that doesn't really take into account the much more distant island of Crete. We can't be certain, but it does seem that Neanderthals did indeed start sailing to the Mediterranean 
and quite possibly on a regular basis, 50,000 years before Homo sapiens first conquered the seas. The opposition to this argument is that the tools on the island have not been chemically dated, so estimates of their age are based entirely on their design. When we take into account the use of fibre technology that we mentioned earlier in the video and the newly discovered 467,000 year old wooden structure in Zambia that shows signs of a great understanding of carpentry, then I don't think it's outlandish to suggest that Neanderthals made boats to sail the seas, but without any archaeological findings, it will be almost impossible to know for sure. Thanks for watching today's video. I hope this helped shed some light on this amazing species of human. With the passing of time, we are finding things out about Neanderthals that we previously thought impossible. And on this channel, I hope to bring these discoveries to your screens in an entertaining and engaging way. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. See you in the next one.